Ladies and gentlemen, fellow slaves of the plantation, welcome to the Vinny Eastwood Show. It's Vinny with a Y because it's the most important question. And Eastwood, like, go ahead, make my news. It's the lighter side of genocide. Just because we're being exterminated doesn't mean we can't make it fun. Otherwise, what's the point of being killed? The Vinny Eastwood Show. And the only thing worse than the truth is Vinny's jokes. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to hour number two of the most animated two hours in talk radio. It's the Finney Eastwood Show, uh, with the exception of the Ghost in the Shell podcast. Now, my very special guest joining me for this hour to talk about uh, the UFO community and the... I I don't don't know what what you'd call it. It's like having a bowl of cornflakes made out of barbed wire and trying to eat it. That's that's what it's like a lot of the time in the truth community because there's all this infighting, there's a lot of infiltration and lots of scumbaggery and that kind of thing. So we're just trying, going to try and elucidate on a lot of the recent developments in the UFO community uh, to date. Randy Morgans from Off Planet Radio, welcome back to the show. Hey, Vinny. You sound really energetic. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Stage nerves, you know. I'm on American Freedom Radio, and they're going, well, you should turn your webcam on. And I'm going, oh, really? Wow, new innovations in radio, eh? This is great. It's like a Dick Dick Tracy wristwatch. That's an American thing for kids from the 60s. Never mind. Anyway, I'm aware aware of it, because I, too, am a dick. Now... Would you be able to elucidate uh, a little bit about this uh, this blue avian cult that we talk- that's been uh, coming up lately? The blue avians, the blue chicken people, that's what Cliff High is calling them. Um, yeah, well, it's not a recent invention. It um, seems to go back uh, two or three years to the emergence of a man named Corey Good, who broke out of the forums at Project Avalon. Um, A lot of this has been chronicled uh, over the last few months on numerous talk radio shows, podcasts, including mine. Um, But Uh, Randy, one one second. Mass because... Uh, uh, One second. We're having a little bit of uh, trouble with your feed, so if you have any uh, web programs open or or, or anything like that, if you could just close them all down and and, uh, get get the uh, prime signal. But... Um, but if you already have, again, I already, I'm a dick. Yeah. Again, I'm a dick. Continue. Are we Are we good? Yes, we are. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. All right. I don't know what's causing that. Um, I'm theoretically got a pretty clean signal. and. Uh, but anyway, let's not worry about it. Oh, wow. Well, we'll survive it. Yep. <laughs> We're good. Right. Uh, all my all, all my bars are lit up. It looks like we're good. So maybe we we're just getting. It's probably the aliens. The bastards don't like us talking about them. Mm. So the blue chicken people and Corey Good. And uh, most people know this story. It's it's gone viral a hundred times. It really kind of lit up around contact in the desert, which occurred um, several weeks ago, in Joshua Tree, California, where Corey Good, who I'll tell you how this all began. My my producer and co-host Emily. Moyer sent me this graphic back in mid-May and said, hey, take a look at this. And it was a picture of Corey Good in a blue uniform with his arms folded like Captain America. And he had this spray tan. He looked marvelous. So it was kind of like, wow. So having ignored this whole situation for a long time, because I really find it mostly trivial, I went over and started to take a look at Corey Good's website. And what I saw actually appalled me, um, fully blown now, um, CGI productions, that's computer graphics for those of you out there, videos, and, and they've really developed the whole branding thing around this blue avian thing that Corey Good came out with uh, as a result of recovered memories, um, good script writers at Gaia TV, David Wilcock. Uh, 
so the blue avian thing was kind of a branding move that gave it a kind of a unique spin because up until now ufology has largely focused on the tall whites and the grays and the tall grays and the reptilians and the draco but we got some pretty aliens finally we got some that are pretty color blue and they they have uh, a very nice sheen to them and they're giving us a message um what i saw on Corey's site was basically the blue avians have a message for humanity and um uh, Gosh, that message is forgive yourself, forgive others, and continue to love. And that's a great message, except there's this little thing called the alien deception that kind of sits out there on the horizon that a lot of people don't seem to understand. Silly humans, you've been dominated by alien species for thousands of years, so now we're going to give you the friendly ones. So that's kind of the nutshell of the whole thing with the Corey Good marketing campaign via the TV show with Guy and uh, Contact in the Desert. Sorry about that. Now, um, I want to read out the, uh, the notes that we put here for and actually go through them as we can. So you're, you're consumed by a media war with assholes in the UFO community. Can you explain that? <laughs> Can you explain no, that really statement? Is. Well, from my perspective right now, I'm watching people just shred each other. Um, there's never really been a strong continuity in the UFO community. There are camps. But what's what's happening now, and especially since the stakes have gotten higher, because remember, this has kind of become a money game. Um, we have an entire camp that comprises the Corey Good contingent that represents what I will call kind of the new age fantasist mode of ufology, the people that really embrace the gestalt of full engagement with alien species in order to complete ourselves as humanity. And there's a whole philosophy that goes into it. There's this whole kind of, well, with the women, it's kind of the earth mother thing with the guys, they're kind of space captains. You know, they really, they really do have kind of a, a comic book theology thing going on. And on the other side of it, you have hard researchers, people who have spent decades really, I will say, doing what I would call journeyman work, documentarian work. Um, the people out there, the Rich Dolans, the, the Joseph Farrells, people who write scholarly tomes and address conferences on a regular basis. And they've taken the stance that largely we require very firm evidence of everything that's being presented. So on the one side, you have the Corey Good Camp, uh, which represents community that's grown up around Kruger's memories, so-called, or the fiction that has been woven by Corey Good, along with his scriptwriters, which includes Jay Widener over at Guy MTV, too. So a lot of this has been data mined and pulled together from other people who have come out previously declaring about the secret space program. Um, you had Randy Kramer. Uh, we just interviewed Andy Bashago, who has been out there talking for, you know, seven or eight years now about Project Pegasus and, yeah. and what yeah. happened in his experiences with Pegasus. You're familiar with to, Andy. Oh, I'm actually um, was speaking to him uh, a couple of days ago, actually. He's, he's going to be coming on in uh, July. Good. Excellent. Yeah. We, yeah, we had a three hour discussion. We're releasing part two of that probably within the next 24 hours. Of that conversation with Andy. Listen, you know, the, the thing about it is what's torn the community apart is that it's factionalized and it's, a lot of people have been marginalized. A lot of the people that actually have good information, not necessarily information that you can place on paper, but what I would call confirmational anecdotal evidence and strong evidence based on things that are beginning to develop right now. On the other hand, the people who have been scraping for documents, filing FOIA requests, um, looking into military documents, have taken a hardened approach that the experiencers simply aren't to be trusted. And in the middle of that comes the Corey Good camp, which has said, screw it, throw everything out the window. We don't need proof of every, anything. Corey's going to lead us through this. He has all of his memories now. And the blue avians have said, hey, this is the way it's going to go. And this has radicalized the people on the documentary side of it because they're saying, look, this guy's just making shit up, which he is. 
you know, we, we demonstrated this. I, I did an interview with Christine Anderson, who was the former wife of Bill Ryan during the time that Corey Good was emerging out of Project Avalon. Christine interviewed Corey Good in his home long before he ever even became, frankly, Corey Good as we know him now. Um, so we know a little bit about the emergence of Corey Good. We know that what began as probably a story of somebody who suffered pretty severe PTSD as a result of being in some kind of government project eventually evolved into somebody who has become a polished product. And that has created a great deal of animosity on both sides of the aisle in the UFO community. So you now have the stratification between the people who are going, no, we need documentation, and the people who are going, we don't have to prove anything. We're just, we're just going to channel the, the whole thing. I mean, come on, man. This is, this is a full-on experience. And so we now have Stephen Greer has disclaimed Corey Good, But then again, Andrew Bashago and another whistleblower, I hate the term whistleblower, let me change that, another discloser who was on our show off Planet Radio, uh, a survivor of MK Ultra, Elisa E., both her and Andy Bashago have identified Stephen Greer as a CIA handler. Um, Andy Bashago identifies Stephen Greer as being a school the Siski used in the 1970s as a 27-year-old man identified to him as a CIA operative. Elisa E. has told us that she distinctly remembers being programmed to Stephen Greer, meaning that Stephen Greer was acting in some fashion as a handler. So you take that for what it's worth out of the mouths or two, a thing may be so. We have two independent witnesses that identify C Stephen Greer as CIA asset, who's now thrown Corey Good under the bus, which has further splintered that aspect of the UFO community as well. Maybe there's, so, an, maybe there's an agenda here to just destroy the UFO community altogether and to make it so factionalized and so radicalized that it won't actually get anywhere near disclosure. It's never going to get near, con my opinion, I'll cloak that. It's never going to get anywhere near disclosure anyway, because there's not a cohesive narrative in most of it. When you boil it down, there is a cohesive narrative. There are things in the sky. There are objects that we cannot identify. Some of them are military. Many of them are military. There are things out there that I believe, many people believe, justifiably so, belong to what we would consider off-world entities, off-world um, forces. But proving that becomes a bit more difficult. We have massive amounts of ET abduction witnesses over decades that indicates something's going on with people who have been abducted, people who have been subjected to testing, um, DNA extraction, uh, hybridization projects, people who have been thrown into time distortion loops, the whole, uh, the whole f syndrome that you have with people who have been taken uh, in the middle of the night, the, the, the sleep par paralysis. I mean, we have to look at the body of evidence, and I'm in favor of that. And I'm in favor of documents wherever we can get them, but I'm also in favor of people's anecdotal evidence which adds up over time and corroboration. I think those are all important. But what it is doing is it's now making it nearly impossible to functionally have a UFO community as such. And what is happening is that big money's come in and co-opted it and melted it into what you would call the MK Ultra CIA super soldier gestalt, which is where you get to the secret space program, which is very problematic. Now, you said they're, um, that they're attempting a fake over, right? That uh, George Norrie is stumbling, fake over, stumbling yes. off to stage left. David Wilcock needs a new act. Roger Ramsar is reported by the dark journalist to be a Satanist, is doing comic books and puppet shows, right? <laughs> and there's a changing of the guard in the disclosure community. There's a changing of the guard in the disclosure community. If a contact in the desert 2017 signaled anything, it was the changing of the guard. It was the handing off of the baton. Um, where coast to coast, George Norrie, uh, the various permutations of Project K, 
Camelot uh, have been the mainstays for UFO disclosure. That's changing. The conferences themselves are changing immensely right now. They're going more into big budget, high ticket, high production, high gloss, people who want to meld high tech media with a so-called disclosure platform, meaning Gaia TV's production of um, the Corey Good story via the secret space program and what that entails. Um, the people who have come forward uh, to try and patchwork into Corey Good's testimony. But at the same time, really, they haven't done anything other than we have a bunch of overlap. We have William Tompkins, who write, writes a book. We have Dr. Michael Sala, who's out there collecting evidence all over the place to attempt to patchwork into Corey Good's story. Everything is streaming towards Corey Good at the moment as the cohesive element that holds all this together. And that's new because in the past, there has not been this cult of personality type figuredom that's now going on. And it's interesting to note that at Contact in the Desert 2017, among other things, the marketing, marketing initiative announced by Corey Good through his business par partner, Roger Ramser, which is basically slated to begin doing animations, comic books, and, and aiming towards bringing younger people into the disclosure movement via a group they're calling Corey's Kids, which even includes giving out disclosure backpacks to kids. It's, it's a novel idea. But where does it take us? Where is this going right now? It's the changing of the garden. It's messy. Well, and also, uh, it's very, very bad when you've got a cult of personality, especially when it's called the Vinnie Eastwood show, but the, the, the <laughs> thing of it, <laughs> but the, the, the thing I want to uh, uh, really kind of uh, point out here is that when you're dealing with people who are at the center of something and they, they're part of a crew and, and, and all of that kind of stuff, there's something uh, somebody told me once, I can't remember who said it. It might've even been a Mark Twain quote or something like that. But if you want to really destroy an idea, create an organization around it. Exactly. All right, the people in the UFO yeah, I mean, community well, that are actually making the, the headway and are actually striving for everything are individuals acting on their own volition, not for profit, and uh, writing books and things of that nature so they can continue to keep doing their works a, a lot of the times. This is, this is the profile that the genuine UFO disclosers actually seem to take, and they do that every single time. And they usually get rejected by other groups of people and chastised and attacked in the media and so on and so forth because they're telling the truth, not because they're crazy. Now, if you could, on the other hand, create a story and a narrative and market it properly so that you could layer the entire UFO community with a crazy story and a cult leader, figurehead, etc., you can essentially tar everybody with a brush and make everybody who was thinking about looking into UFO disclosure and the vast rafts of evidence that there is about it and suddenly dismiss it all. all right, I'm, I'm just spitballing here. You know, they can't all be gold. No, 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 but, the, but you're actually close to the idea. On one hand, it is a co-opting of the movement. On the other, it is actually tangentially discrediting of the movement because it's, it's, it's trivial, trivializing it. When you know, and this is the serious aspect of all of this, when the narrative spins this far into the realm of fiction, what gets marginalized is the fact that there are real people. There are the Andrew Bashagas, the Duncan O'Finians, the Elisa E's. There are dozens and dozens of people who have come forward to relate horrible, horrific stories about MK Ultra and other black, black ops mind control projects over decades. This is not conjecture at this point. These people exist. These people have documented it. The government itself, through the Rockefeller Commission in the 1970s, admitted there was a project MK Ultra. We know that these projects existed, still exist, are still running, and there are a whole bunch of us out here that have been saying for decades, listen, these people have been screwing with us. They've been screwing with our kids. They've been screwing with people in general. There's a mind control program going on. 
And the UFO overlap when this largely comes into play with something that's called mill labs, which means that the military has in some way either in concert with off-world entities or on its own been doing abductions as well. All of this is very murky and very gray because we can't get to the nub of it because we're all fighting over it with each other. I recall... Uh... So in a sense... Uh, like in 2014 or something like that, a statistic came out that there were like 20,000 uh, abductions in the content reported in the continental U.S. in 2014 or something like that, mm -hmm. and there were like mm -hmm. 12 uh, UFO abductions reported for the whole rest of the world, right? Or, or <laughs> and it's just like okay, maybe that story that came out about the U.S. government signing a treaty with one specific alien it's species in exchange yeah. for harvesting rights of the U.S. population so that they could test their weapons on them and and uh, harvest their genetic material or use yes. them as use them as hors d'oeuvres, whatever, uh, uh, has some truth to it. Right, right. That, that was the Greater Treaty that was allegedly signed by Eisenhower in 1954, which, interestingly enough, kicks off this whole era when you begin to see the massive ramp up of human abductions and people that are disappearing. It's also in parallel as well to the people who were being sucked into black ops projects in the same period of time. First generation MK Ultra begins roughly around that time in the mid 1950s and continues onward. So there are there's parallel tracks to all of this. And again, I just you know I want to point out that when we turn all of this into an entertainment medium, we have to pretty it up. We have to make it look nice. You can't tell the little kiddies that they're going to take you into a room and put electrodes onto your head and shock you to split you so you have five different personalities they can program as assassins or spies or any of the other operations that they want people to do. Like six That's kittens. the extreme end of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, what's getting lost in the whole argument now is the reality of some very dark things um the cory good story goes into that but it doesn't really go to the meat of it because quite frankly you can't sell that that has to be cleaned up that has to be sanitized now so in a, in a literal sense yes right now they are tearing each other apart over this yeah, well, it was your uh, viral post on Facebook that actually kicked off this whole thing. It was uh, leaked right. leaked to the uh, the good camp. Maybe that's a bad way of describing them, and uh, discombobulated the entire universe. And uh, well, apparently, good old Bill Ryan drug himself out of obscurity after four years of doing nothing to write an expose on the Blue Avian Cult and Corey Good. Yeah, that's the rough, that's the rough, um, yeah, what happened, there was a Facebook post that I made, which theoretically, it gets seen by, I don't know, I've got, I think, 1,900 followers on Facebook, so theoretically, maybe 100 people would see the post, but the post got put on to Project Avalon by, by a third party, and it was picked up by Bill Ryan, who did acknowledge my post as the genesis for his then- going forward and compiling all of the Corey Good information um, as a way of creating a narrative of the emergence of Corey Good from Project Avalon. Now, all that would be fine, except that that's, that's not really what happened. What really happened was it was a very contoured narrative that misses a lot of the finer points that went into the story in the background including what happens in forums, specifically Avalon, in terms of personalities, the cult aspects of Project Avalon, the amount of mind control that goes into Project Avalon, and the fact that at some point, people's buttons get pushed in a certain way that forces them to take actions that then go into what we had with Corey Good, which was kind of a meltdown, it was kind of a separation, and that was somewhat engineered. There were two in, two interviews with Corey Good. The first one was done by Christine Anderson. She did a second interview that Bill Ryan deemed unfit to be aired because he said the sound quality was bad. Um, the sound was cleaned up by a friend of mine who I've spoken with several times. 
He's known as the Ruiner. He is, he's also known as Shane. And Shane provided the narrative for that second audio as well, which was effectively the end of Christine Anderson's relationship with Bill Ryan, the end of Project Avalon's association with Corey Good, and a complete fracturing of the Project Avalon forum as well. So the narrative that's now been spun by, by Bill Ryan, courtesy of the dark journalist who gave him three hours, uh, has been put out there as the official narrative because... Uh, Aside from the fact that I brought out the interview with Christine Anderson and Shane the Ruiner, there has been no alternative narrative offered on what really went on. We put up a document with 150 pages of, of lost, deleted, redacted, changed, altered entries into um, online forums made by Corey Good that traces the whole narrative of how he went from this unemployed IT worker in, in, in Texas to being courted, sparked, contracted, signed, and filmed by Gaia TV to do this major groundbreaking, and it is, TV series about the secret space program. That's, that's quite a leap in two years. I, I, I will say, you know, we came a long way on that one. And that narrative was nurtured as well in the background by several key figures that includes Dr. Mike, Michael Sala and Jay Widener, who is a writer at Gaia TV, who was brought on board to basically bring this thing up to production level. Mm-hmm. Well, Jay's a good writer. He could probably do it. Um, yeah, now, he's a hell of a writer. I was just thinking about this Certainly as well, though. Script this, this Corey's kids aspect, right? Um I was just thinking about all the processes of cult indoctrination and it's get the kids, have a claim of truth, repeat the claim of truth, ostracize people who don't um, agree with you, that kind of thing, attack other people and claim that they're working for the enemy when they discredit you and so on and so forth. And it's like every single bar along a classic cult indoctrination technique is right there. Right on. Um, yep. Now, <clears throat> there's another aspect well, the of, I think, well, well, one second, uh, the, uh, who was it? There was a, there was a lady, a really really famous lady in the UFO community, who Corey Good put on his um, uh, one of the slides of one of his presentations or something that she was supporting his work, and she wasn't, and she'd Linda never Moulton heard. Linda Moulton Howe. Linda Moulton Howe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Linda, Linda Moulton Howe. Who, by the way, is a friend of the dark journalist. <laughs> so, <laughs> just. Tossing that out there, just saying, yeah, um, the details of that are a little murky. I traced it back. We have a disclaimer statement from Linda Moulton Howe that says she is not associated with or working with Corey Good or Gaia TV in any way. Uh, this was largely as part of a book that's being written by, again, Michael Sala, William Tompkins, Corey Good, and several other people in what I guess is going to be some sort of uh, anthology type document work um, for full disclosure now. So basically, they're putting together a group of people to put out what's effectively going to be the full disclosure now uh, narrative in printed form. And, and it was said that Linda Moulton Howe was going to be a part of this. So, well, we don't, I don't have enough input from Linda Moulton Howe. I don't have connection to or to know except that the statement was issued on her website stating she was not a part of this project mm. and uh i it was alleged by the dark journalist that the reason he put linda mountains molten uh name on that slide is to give him credibility uh and it only took like two seconds for anybody to find out whether or not she had support of it so and they haven't retracted that and explained it and said, oh, well, we made a mistake or, or something like that. They deliberately did it. They deliberately lied to give themselves credibility yeah. so that they could indoctrinate new people into this new blue avian cult that they're creating uh, to divide the uh, disclosure community and essentially co-opt an entire new generation of uh, potential UFO disclosure initiates that they're going to indoctrinate as children with these... Um, Little, what are they called? Disclosure backpacks with full of goodness knows what goodies, you know. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, the granola bars and comic books and condoms and who knows what. Uh, fairy dust. Um, that's the plan. The plan is largely to go after a younger generation. And, you know, well-financed enough. Uh, certainly with uh, You were talking earlier about how this profiles as a cult. That was the original post that I made on Facebook. That was the point of the whole thing. This looks, it smells like a cult. When you see how they're using everything from colors to CGI graphics to how they pose Corey Good, how all of this is being framed in such a way that it pulls people into a believer state. Because the whole point of a cult is obviously to get them to believe enough that they invest in the cult. Right. It was Andy. the Jesuits that said, give me a child of seven years old and I have them for life. Do, so, of don't course, you find you're going to go for the kids. Don't you find this very interesting, the timing of it? Just as the flat earth cult starts to lose its momentum and go down, yeah. this one comes up. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're being played on a grand scale here on a day-by-day decade by decade basis i think maybe every eight to ten years the exact same narrative that was once being put around starts getting put around again right like uh like an election more or less you know the same guy that comes in and promises to undo all the crap that the old guy did and then he winds up doing all the new crap that uh, everybody else was doing the whole time anyway and it makes no effing difference and it's the same thing we're being co-opted we're being cult indoctrinated we're being recruited we're being sabotaged all right and that, that's another thing the word sabotage do you think this Corey good uh ufo uh disclosure movement could qualify as essentially sabotaging all the work that the ufo disclosure community has done to date look at the state of mufon right now look what's going on with mufon mufon is being splintered you'll also. have to explain uh, uh, mufon to me i'm unfamiliar mufon is the mutual ufo network that this is the large organization uh, the largest organization in the United States, which is theoretically a clearinghouse and investigative uh, nonprofit organization for ufology. They basically have chapters in every state and they have investigators that go out. They are investigative. They are researched. They are supposed to be running databases. There's a big dog in ufology here in the United States. MUFON itself has experienced a number of stumbling blocks lately. It actually has for years. It's been co-opted for a number of years. The, the director of the state of Pennsylvania has just had to step down after making racist remarks, horrible racist remarks. I wouldn't even repeat them. Um, we're seeing fracturing inside of MUFON on a number of fronts right now. We're also seeing globally how even the Rendlesham Forest narrative is breaking down as um, the co-author, and I'm not going to name names here, but the co-author of the key book on the Rendlesham Forest incident has now disclaimed that narrative as having been hoaxed as well. We have massive amounts of discrediting over Roswell. And as we look at this, Vinny, 70 years we're still talking about Roswell like it's the mother load of ufology. We're still talking about Randallsham, which is over 40 years old now. We had this, this, this Stephen Greer, Stephen Bassett f sponsored in the United States um, forum on disclosure, which featured prominent American politicians and um, uh, the gentleman from Canada, Paul Hellyer, appeared there as well. And they really opened no new ground at all. They, they spent enormous amounts of money. They had it on TV. They made videos. UFOlogy is going nowhere right now because, quite frankly, on the one hand, it's been run by a bunch of old farts who haven't uncovered much of anything in the last 20 years. And on the other hand, you now have the young upstarts who just want to basically blow this out into fantasy land. Well, it seems uh, relating this to back to the, uh, the Flat Earth thing because I was like, hmm, Flat Earth Movement ca came up, and then all of a sudden, everybody who was a conspiracy theorist about anything, where 9-11 was an inside job, vaccines are bad for you, fluoride's bad, it doesn't matter what it was, everybody suddenly started getting called a Flat That's Earther. Right. 
Okay, and it right. did, and it it set yeah. the movement back a decade. It set the movement back a fucking decade. Like it hasn't been since two thousand eight, two thousand seven, yeah. when uh, there was the uh, building three, uh, 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 or building seven, or building what, and, and the building uh, seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of that stuff started coming out ten years ago, and we're now back to freaking square one because of this flat Earth cult. And uh, I'm predicting that uh, this blue avian cult is going to do the same thing to the UFO community. What do you think about that? No, it absolutely is. The flat earth thing. And you'll see the same thing in this. You see this extremism. Um, with the flat earth, the flat earth thing became so extreme, so volatile, that none dare bring it up anymore except in closed circles. The flat earthers have gone off. They said, fuck you. If you don't believe in flat earth, we don't even want to talk to you. Meanwhile, the rest of us are going, look, we can have a reasonable conversation about this. I kind of in a camp that says, you know, it could be... It could be both, frankly, or neither. I'm good with that. But they're not good with that. They stratify, they harden, they create this enormous divide, which then takes all these other issues that have been part and parcel of the truth disclosure movement, and it takes them all and just dumps them into a chasm somewhere where everybody's just going, I don't even want to talk to you anymore. Okay, well, And that is what's happening with the UFO movement as well right now. Yeah. Well, just to clear this up once and for all, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know whether or not the Earth is flat or round, it's neither. It's a holographic fractal representation of collective consciousness exactly. co-creating co itself. All right? Exactly. <laughs> it's just that simple. We agree on that. We agree on that. I but. mean, and the reason why I say that is because there's a lot of points that get brought up in the Flat Earth videos that actually do make a lot of sense. And there's a lot of points that get yeah. made up in the Round Earth things that do make a lot of sense. And a lot of things that get brought up in the this is a digital universe that make a lot of sense. And a lot of things that talk about the fractal universe and the nature of our fractured reality that make a lot of sense. So what it, that says to me is it's all of them actually combined together. But, you know, that's my theory. I could be wrong. Maybe uh, maybe God isn't what I think it is. Maybe it, it's not a collection of organisms packed together on a planet and their latent psionic energy uh, developing its own universal consciousness, which actually determines the will of the other organisms and affects them on a subatomic level. You know, maybe that's not the case. I could be wrong. For good. I, I, think the, I think what we really have to bear in mind here is we need to maintain a certain sense of discovery and wonder about anything we research. Some things are hard in facts. Look, it's very clear. We have a malevolent governmental dark empire sitting over us that wants to frankly kill us only after they've sucked us dry of all material wealth that we possess. That's, that's pretty demonstrable. That shit needs to be dealt with. But there are some things that fall into a realm of discovery that I'm okay with not having full disclosure now. I really am, because quite frankly, the disclosure I've had so far is quite enough for me. I've seen the shit. I don't need somebody to spoon feed me disclosure. Ditto with the earth. Whatever it is, it's a marvelous construct. I'm willing to behold the wonder of it every day and marvel at its construction. And like Mr. Tesla, basically understand that we live in something that's kind of energetic and kind of beautifully mysterious. Mm. I'm good with that. Well, I, I think the, uh, the key here, if we want to keep our heads about us, regardless of the topic, is to approach it with a sense of detachment. All right. If yeah. you have emotional detachment to it, uh, uh, if you have emotional detachment, it means that you can then engage the left hemisphere of your brain, which thinks in black and white facts and, and that kind of thing. But what's problematic, and I came up with a theory last night while we were at this uh, Vax meeting, well, it wasn't a Vax meeting, but um, talking about <laughs> how the cognitive dissonance, all right, and I was like, Oh my God, I think I just figured out how, on a physiological level, how cognitive dissonance works. The left side of your brain, the right side of your brain, the emotional part of your brain, the thing that thinks in color, holds a belief that vaccines are safe mm -hmm. and effective. 
Now, you're telling them, and you're trying to appeal to the uh, left side of their brain, that it's not, and here's evidence, and so on and so forth. Now, what this causes is a schism between the two hemispheres of the brain. And uh, what happens then is those two entire hemispheres get shut down. And the energy of the thought process then proceeds down to the lower reptilian brain. So human brains exactly. have, got, have got three brains. We've got a reptilian brain on the lower cortex that can, governs our fight, flight mechanisms. It's the same as all the other reptiles in the world. We have a mammalian brain, which is where our emotions and, uh, and perception and sense of community come from. And we have a primate brain, which does a lot of the higher brow thinking and higher thought functions and is essentially the key to our spiritual evolution with the pineal gland and all of that kind of shit. Now, when yep. you, on the other hand, have those two hemispheres in conflict with somebody who has a very strongly held belief, when they're being presented with facts that completely contradict that belief, both hemispheres shut down and they go into instant fight or flight mode. This is why they get tremendously aggressive instantaneously with almost mm -hmm. no pushing. Okay, it's because their brain is literally not working. They're operating in survival mode. This person is trying to kill me! Fuck you! And they, they, br <laughs> they bring... The, the term is bringing a bazooka to a knife fight. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's my two cents on that. I thought it was quite an interesting thought, you know. Again, maybe it's relevant. Maybe it's not. But other than that, we've talked about this uh, this cult and all of, all of that stuff. Is there any other points that are actually really important <clears throat> about this? Yeah, I think there's a lot of points about it that are that are very important. Um, if it wasn't important, uh, the folks over at the Jimmy Church show wouldn't be having a roundtable discussion tonight, asking is the UFO community infiltrated. And the answer to that is, yes, it is infiltrated, and it is the infiltrators that are making the declaration that the UFO community is infiltrated, because they've declared themselves the, the new front that's going to run the UFO community. In other words, there's a declaration on the table, it was basically made a contact in the desert that says, we're here, we're taking over. And... They may not have said it in those words, but the intention has been very clear that this is a leading edge movement right now, where basically the old guard is moving out and the new guard is taking over. And it's going to be very much a high end media savvy campaign for a certain type of disclosure, which goes into a lot of the spiritual aspects of this, of the danger of allowing ourselves to just openly believe that that because in theory higher beings may in theory have higher technology therefore those beings also have higher morality well i've never seen proof of that i mean we have higher technology here in the united states and uh, for the last 70 years we've used that technology to basically run rough shot over the entire planet. So I don't think we were necessarily more moral as a result of our advanced technology. And then yet we're willing to cede that in theory to some 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 blue feather people who have come along and given us a message that in itself at its core essence might be fine, except that they're sort of telling you you really aren't there yet. You humans haven't evolved. You're still basically murderous, dangerous uh, savages running roughshod over a planet, which I don't think we need anybody outside of humanity to tell us that. How, how is that not religious indoctrination? You're bad. You're going to hell. Religious. You've got original well, sin. Well, this is religious. Yeah. And somebody else has to do that. It always has to be an outside party. It always has to be a higher power. It's always got to have these mysterious abilities, and it requires that you basically check your brains at the door and believe that this higher power, higher force in some way is going to heal you and make you whole rather than doing what humans really need to do, which is what I call total responsibility. We need to admit as a race, we've screwed up for a long time. We need to admit as individuals, we've screwed up for a long time, but then we've got to do something about it. 
I might be willing to forgive myself and forgive others, but there's another aspect to this. Shit's got to change on this world, and shit's got to change even within these communities right now. The message of the Blue Avians is sort of counterbalanced by the amount of greed that's also going on in these communities because, quite frankly, uh, these people are not bashful about charging $10,000 for a speaking engagement and a table full of ancillary marketing items and the fact that there are all kinds of contracts on the table and the fact that this is all being subsidized by a company that has, let's just say, a lack of transparency in how they're funded. I'm talking about Gaia TV and exactly how much money they're able to lose in their franchise in order to advance things like the secret space program, Corey Good Adventure. It appears as though they're willing to lose money on this because it's lost money. But other people have made money and there is a money incentive in the background of all of this. There's a lot of money in lies, but not a whole lot of money of in course. truth. No money in truth, as you and I both know. I mean, <laughs> what's wrong with yeah. us, Randy? Are we, are we fucking stupid? Like, <laughs> we're stupid. <laughs> we're stupid. You, don't, you just don't have a good enough story, damn it. Because we're, <laughs> at the end of the day, we're just not willing to sit down and write a good script. I, I think... The, uh, one thing I ju just occurred to me this morning, bro, and I was like thinking about how I'm a narcissist and how a lot of narcissists are good liars and all of that kind of stuff. But what, <laughs> why don't I lie all the time? You know, why don't I lie to my audience? Why don't I, why don't I blow things out of proportion and, 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 and that kind of thing? Why don't I do it? It's because unlike most narcissists, I got consequences for my actions. You're not, right, right? you're not a malignant narcissist. No. And, uh, I got consequences through my actions throughout my life that taught me very, uh, very uh, painful lessons that I've kind of taken to heart. So now if I even think about lying, my heart rate starts uh, bubbling up and I start getting really stressed out and freaked out and that kind of thing. And the only way that I can live without fear is to live with the truth 100 uh, percent with all of the benefits and flaws that come along with that, apart from. When I'm speaking to a liar, when I'm speaking to a liar, why no officer, I don't have three bags of weed in my pocket. <laughs> well, there's a I learned that one the hard way, though. <laughs> lying and lying and deception. I mean, hey, the, you play poker, you do deception. Life's life's kind of a poker game. But you don't lie and you don't manipulate people and you don't fabricate these gigantic tales for the purposes of marketing yourself as a so-called whistleblower truth teller when most of your story has been gleaned from other people who have gone before you, reverse engineered, data mined, and then contoured in such a way that you have a slick marketing package. That's my problem with the whole Corey Good. Gaia TV secret space program as it's being marketed right now. Well, yeah. And, and again, this uh, goes into the thing. What was I saying last night at the vest thing? Ah, yes. Lying. It's very, very hard to spot lying unless you know what you're looking for. Okay. Woman drowned her children one time. Okay. She drove her car into a lake and the two kids died. She got out of the car and then she uh, ran to the police station and said, oh my God, I had an accident and my children are dead. Police officer instantly asked her, did you kill them? And she goes, I would never do anything like that. I'm a good mother. I love my children. Did she say no? She didn't, did she? Right. All right. That's when you know somebody's lying when you ask them a very direct question and they give you an incredibly indirect answer that goes around and around and around. That's right. That's uh, something I learned uh, in talk radio. There's been people on this show that I must say after the show is over, I was just like, that person's a lying psychopath. I hope my audience is <clears throat> discernible, uh, um, has enough discernment to tell truth from fiction and is also capable of opening up and even listening to people who are full of shit because even in a desert of lies one might find a grain of truth right 
that's the kind of, that's the kind of um, yeah. that's the quick that's the intellectual quicksand that we uh, that we wade through on a daily basis whenever we communicate with other human beings. There is deception. There is scumbaggery. There is bad memories. Even I've said things on this show that aren't true because I like said them and then I was like, wait a second, wait a second, was that right? And then I go back and I go, ah. Oh, Bloody hell, I forgot. It was actually 1986 that they did that, not 1987. What a fucking idiot. You know, <laughs> just, but just, well, but there's, and you, you know, you'll talk to Andrew Bashago. He talks about this a lot where there's just too many facts supporting too slim a narrative. That's the difference. And it's a lot, everybody has factual gaps in their memory. And I'm sorry, if you've smoked enough weed, if you're over 30, you have a viable deniability for bad memory anyway. Okay, we're human. We don't have perfect memory. Yeah. But there's a world of difference between that and fabricating an entire whole cloth narrative. You then have to go and stitch all of this Frankensteinian bullshit on to make it work. When I, I've always said this, the best narratives are kind of broken. There's the gaps there where you go, I don't remember that. I mean, I experienced that. There are things I have memories of, and there are things I have detailed memories of, and then there are things where I just go, you know, I don't know. And searching my mind, I still don't know. It's a broken narrative. That's human. When it gets too perfect, when there's too many details, that's when you need to really start looking at how it's been contoured, how it's been put together. How it's been scripted. Scripted, yeah. Right, and that's right Jay Widener? Yep. I mean, I'm a writer, so I know what scripting is, you know? You've got to... Mm -hmm. I mean, we did that just before the show today. We took down a whole bunch we of did. notes, we and, the, and then we reread it as a, as a, as a full uh, Facebook post and everything like that. So you can see how good I am at the writing and the spelling and the, and, and the and how you actually keep thoughts uh, congruent and go, and go through the thing. And it's like, hmm, what... It took actually quite a bit of effort to... Uh, narrate and put in a sequential order the things that we naturally come up with on the fly. Left, right, centre, up, down, and, and, and all over the place. This is where all these ideas come from, but they all connect in the centre. And that's what good writing is, essentially. It's just taking all the disparate elements and linking them together, like a good Monty Python skit. There are, you know, I just, I just want to say this, too, because we're going to run out of time. There are really good researchers out there in the margins of ufology right now. There are really good people who are bringing evidence forward on shows like this one. People who have put themselves at a certain amount of risk, who have done uh, extraordinary things, who have great stories to tell. They need to be heard. We can't let the air get sucked out of the room by marketing campaigns and glitzy productions. You know, I'm, I don't, I have a friend, uh, he's been on our show a couple times, Sean Gautreau, does this amazing work. He has a, a YouTube channel called Industrial Surrealism. Sean has shot amazing footage of what sits over the skies, of what's inside the clouds. He's used very simple tools and photography and treatment. Sean is an artist and he's put together a compendium of evidence that shows there is shit in the sky that we really need to look at this because, man, I'm telling you, there's platforms up there and there's all kinds of wild shit going on. And nobody's talking about Sean Gautreau's evidence. They want to talk about the Blue Avians. Popularity is not necessarily a representation of truth. If anything, it's the direct no. opposite. It's an inverse relationship. Is it incredibly yeah. unpopular and everybody hates you for speaking about it? Yep, yes. it's probably true. Is it incredibly right. popular and everybody loves you and pats you on the back and, and provides you with no challenges whatsoever? You're a full of shit cunt. All right, <laughs> All right. That's, the, that's the spectrum. <laughs> exactly. exactly, yeah. All right. yeah. Randy uh, Morgan's... Off Planet Radio. 
I can't. It was not full of shit. Thank you very much for coming on the show today, hey, brother. Thank you, my brother. All right. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for supporting the Vinnie Eastwood Show. Go to that Patreon, please. Give us a dollar a month donation and we will lend you into the uh, Facebook group where you will get access to all the new shows and everything like that before they're made public, the brand new video versions as well. And uh, you will get that as a Patreon regardless. It's just if you donate in any other way whatsoever through the kiwi bank or the paypal we'll just make sure to have those links available to you through either patreon or the uh, uh vinnie eastwood donors group so thank you very much see you again sometime <laughs>